Disclaimer. Judge Ron Rangel is providing this podcast and website for educational purposes only, as well as to give the public general information regarding topics related to the criminal justice system. The views, thoughts, and opinions of his guest speakers are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Judge Rangel. All rise. You are now listening to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Rangel, educating the public and expanding mindsets. Subscribe on our website, beyondthegavelpodcast.com, or your favorite podcast platform for more of the latest podcast episodes and updates. Welcome to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Rangel. I am your host. Today in the studio, we have Charles Gold. Now, Charles was born in Houston, Texas, and raised in Fredericksburg. He proudly served in the U.S. Army and the National Guard. He graduated from UTSA with a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice and minor in American Studies. Gold pursued his passion in criminal justice and attended St. Mary's Law School, where he graduated in the top 11% of his class and was selected to be an editor of the prestigious Law Review organization. He served as a Bear County prosecutor for over two years, where he tried over 40 cases as a prosecutor. Subsequently, he opened up his own law firm in 2004, specializing in DWIs, family violence, assault, drug abuse, and a multitude of criminal cases. He also has experience with civil legal work to include adoptions, divorce, contracts, and so forth. And he loves helping folks across the great state of Texas. One of the fixtures in our courtroom, Charles, welcome to the program. Thank you, Judd. Glad to be here. You know, one of the things when you come in that I love talking to you about, you grew up in Fredericksburg, almost like a suburb of San Antonio, but Correct. far enough away, it's still kind of country. Yes, sir. Very, very country. I remember uh, going there as a kid. My grandmother and everybody spoke German. Nice. Yes. Nice. I grew up in Portland, Texas, which is kind of the same corpus, like not too close, far enough to where you're kind of in the country. Sure. So we have a lot in common. I think we do, Judge. I yeah. There's a lot of overlap. Yeah. I love seeing you in the courtroom. We're here to talk about your work as a criminal defense attorney. And and basically, the idea is this. Let's say I'm an individual that comes in, in whatever shape or form that I take, and I say, hello, Mr. Gold, I want to hire you as a lawyer. I just got arrested. Well, there's a lot of different things that can happen. Sometimes when and how you get arrested happens as well. Like a lot of times they get pulled over for like a DWI mm -hmm. or uh, my Uncle Alan, 20 years ago, he was a firefighter never get in trouble or anything like that he goes to get his uh commercial driver's license because he drives a big fire truck and all of a sudden he gets arrested he goes to dps my aunt calls me and said alan's getting arrested for cattle rustling what happened <laughs> i mean right <laughs> and so he was doing some work for my grandfather in giddings and he i guess one of the other cows from another place came over and he went and sold it as well and so anyway that's what could happen you never know it could like happen years ago they don't even know or you could be in the act of committing a offense itself like a dwi and then right. you get arrested so if a police officer sees the crime that's being committed Sure. He, has the, he or she has the opportunity to arrest somebody. Exactly. Or let's say somebody accused you of committing a crime like a family violence assault. Sure. You fled the scene. The police came out, spoke to whoever the complaining witness is, made a report, determined that there's probable cause. Then there's a warrant for that person's arrest, and they're completely unaware of it until someday they go to DPS. Exactly. Or they're stopped, didn't do a lane change and violation, and all of a sudden they get stopped. They're like, what are you talking about? I have a warrant out for my arrest. So hopefully what we try to do is catch that beforehand. We can always try to call and get a warrant check. And if there is, then then hopefully we can go to the judge or the prosecutor and try to agree to uh, some sort of bond amount. We could do a satellite here in Bear County. Mm -hmm. So that's before they get arrested. That's before they get arrested. That's some work that we can do. How do you do that? Well, that's a, that's a good question, Judge. So for instance, a client will call like, oh my God, I, I left. I think something's bad going to happen. It was an accident. I rear-ended somebody, but they came and yelled at me. So I took off so I can do a number of things. I'll call the detective. I'll find out the municipality that went out there. Right. I can talk to them and say, we file, let me know. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Right. But usually I have my secretary call every week and do a warrants check if I see it. And then that time I call and say like, hey, there's a warrant. I find out what court that's in. 
I go to the judge or I go to the prosecutor usually first, and I say, hey, can we agree on a bond amount? And if I can agree, then I'll go to the judge. And, and the judge is 99% of the time from that point, they'll just sign it at that point. So sometimes somebody comes to you and they say, the detective called me. They want me to come in. What do I do? Exactly. You know, what happens there? I always say no. <laughs> do not. I mean, unless you're, because a lot of times they don't know what the cop knows. And so the cop knows something that they don't. And so they're at a huge disadvantage. And this is very important to know some of the rights, like your right to remain silent. Right. I mean, I was in Fredericksburg yesterday and there was two people, two good kids who have never been in trouble before. And I say kids are young men. And, you know, within the first minute or two of the of them talking with the officer, they've already confessed. Right. And that's really tough. That's really hard for me. Juries might not always believe my clients, but they always believe them when they confess. Right. I promise you that much. <laughs> One of the things I used to tell people is you have no idea what you're admitting to, right? Exactly. Because when the state charges somebody, they're charging them with certain offenses, which have certain elements, who, what, when, where, how type things. Sure. And so just by saying, my name is blank. They've already given the state some of the elements that they need to prosecute cases. Exactly. Is that the kind of things that you talk oh, to them about? Absolutely. And so usually what I'll do is like, look, I'll call the detective right. and I'll just be dumb and I'll say, okay, we'll call you back. And we might not never call back or anything like that. But it, it's very important because, as you said, just by them calling, they open themselves up to so much. And they, I mean, anybody looks at that, these cops are not dumb. They're, most of them are pretty good. They're used to that. And, and they understand that, you know, that they have some things. They can, well, you were there, weren't you? Yes. Well, let me, you have your side of the story. And then people kind of talk and they minimize their, their activity or whatever they did. And all of a sudden, before you know it, they look bad and there's nothing I can do. You know, one of the things that police agents are allowed to do is literally lie to people that they're questioning, interrogating, asking trying to get information from them. People don't always understand that. They go, hey, the police officer lied to me. Therefore, the case should be thrown out. What do you say about that? Uh, no, it's unfortunately, you can't lie to them, but they can lie to you. And yes, and it happens. It does. They'll sit there and they'll, they might pretend something that's not true. Or they'll have a question that already has kind of an assumption or an implication in there that says that they're guilty. Something like, hey, we have the opportunity to collect the DNA. There is DNA that's available. Sure. Or they'll say, hey, we've spoken to this other person. You know, the other person told us everything that happened. Right. Right. The, Those or, kinds of or even... You know, they're trained for this and they know that people want to be agreeable. You know, here's when you need to be disagreeable. If you're at a traffic stop, you have nothing to hide. Let me search your vehicle then. You're like, right. and so if you say no, by saying no, then that implies you have something to hide. That's true. That's and so true. you just say, no, I don't have anything to hide. I just don't want you searching through my car. So somebody comes in, you determine whether or not there's a warrant for their arrest. You figure out if there's a detective or somebody to talk to. You work on the bond. What's that process like in your career? What well, a lot of times, uh, Thankfully, now we can do a lot of it by emails, calling and uh, send it to the court, talk to your, your clerk and say, hey, is a judge wrong hell available? No, I'm going to send them an email or I might attach a motion for agreed bond. Right. And so they'll do that. And uh, it's great. Then I might get an email back with your signature, a judge's signature, a great saying, OK, that's fine. At that point, then it's going to save the, the client a lot of time at this point. Yeah, and it'll save the county taxpayer oh, dollars as well. Exactly. You know, that's one of our problems as you well aware <laughs> is our jail. I mean, they're just, it's overflowing with people and, right. you know, our taxpayers have to pay for it. And there's a lot of people that just can't afford it that get stuck in there. Right. And even people that are, you know, just might be innocent. I mean, you know, I've got several cases where somebody was arrested and, and like, hey, you have to have GPS. I'll send them in there for three or four days. But if it's not GPS, but I can go through the satellite office. How does that work? A lot of times people call me and they'll say, you know, the bond was granted. They went to a bond agent attorney or, or a bonding company, they turn in the paperwork. It's been three days and they're still not out. And then you look at it and you go, well, there was a GPS order. How does that work? What you have to have in your house, my understanding is you have to have a landline. And so most people don't have that anymore. Most people just have a cell phone to call. So there's nothing there because they have to download where they're at. Kind of like with a scram, I think, with an alcohol monitoring system as well that, that goes around the ankle. Right. Uh, those have to be downloaded down, so you need a landline with that. And so people have to go out and buy a landline. And then there has to be other people at the jail 
fitting the, the people with the GPS or with the scram or whatever it might be, because that, that's going to be a condition for them to get out. And so it might take several days. Sometimes there's no home to go to. That's a, Yes, right. that's an issue as well, right? So, sometimes somebody's homeless. They've been staying at the Haven for Hope, which for those that don't live in Bear County is a location for homeless individuals. Exactly. Sometimes the crime that is alleged to have occurred happened against the homeowner, mm-hmm. maybe somebody that they lived with. or That's always a tough one. Yeah. Like yeah. if it's a family of violence, where are they going to go? So I can imagine you do a lot of handholding in those situations. Yeah. I think it's also important for me to listen. I think a lot of these people, they have these feelings and emotions. They're new. They're a lot of uh, anxiety and stress, and they just need somebody to, to listen to them and to kind of guide them. Like you said, to hold their hand and kind of walk through it because it's unknown. Knowledge is power. Right. Knowledge is power. And so if you don't know what's going on, it's a shock to the system. That's the counselor at law part of your profession, right? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important part of it. Right. It, it really is. I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, we get so busy in our lives being attorneys, you're juggling tragedies. <laughs> you, you go from right. one to the next. And so we kind of forget the human side that we're dealing with sometimes. So when you get to that stage, obviously you've had some sort of deal worked out, right? A lot of your cases are retained. People yes, can hire you. That's correct. So you got to have contracts. Yes, sir. Do you always have a contract in all of your cases? Judge, I'm country boy. I'm old school. Yeah. A lot of mine are, are just handshakes. I, yeah. I've done maybe... Two percent of my cases are contracts. I, mean, I probably should, but I just I'm old school and I I try to do everything by writing. I said like you know it might be an X price for a DWI out of Blanco County or something like that, and then they'll say agreed, and so that's it. That's what I'm going to charge you without a trial. Yeah, or just a, a flat fee. That's right. what they would say. That's we're one of the last few segmented areas that we could do that. Well, one of the things that I used to do when I was practicing is I had a contract, and on my contract I was paid hourly. So if they contacted me a lot, if they required a lot of communications with me, I'd keep track of everything. Sure. And usually I wouldn't do anything about it. But every now and then there was a client where they sort of required me contacting them and saying, hey, I've already used up this many hours. I'm going to start charging you by the hour according to our contract if you want me to continue to, to call you every day. Again. Right. There's some people that are just that's a lot of handholding. So somebody hires you. You're dealing with the DA, they go through the bond process, what happens there? At this point, once they get out, they're like, oh my God, Charles, what am I going to do? And so it's kind of kind of going off for their word. And, and a lot of times, some people don't have recollection. And I used to think, well, maybe it was alcohol or drugs or something, but it's kind of like we were saying, it's just all that anxiety, all that stress is pumped through. People just forget about it. I mean, just they kind of black out. It's interesting just to see that. But in evaluating their case... I get a police report. I get discovery pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And I can kind of see like, hey, if there's any weaknesses or what this person might need to be doing. So is this some a case that I need to fight or is this something that might be mitigation? Like if it's a first timer, you know, every, it's a case by case basis, of course. If, if I have an 18 year old and he gets stopped and he has a vape pen in school, that's kind of a common thing right now. Right. It's a felony now. You know, if you have a marijuana, it's in the leaf form, it's a misdemeanor. But if you have a cartridge, which is an oil form, then it's a, a felony. It's an automatic state jail so, felony. So we have 17, 16, 18-year-old kids that are vaping with this THC. They pick up a felony. Every school is a little bit different how they handle it. But, you know, they might get arrested. They get put in jail. And mom's calling me like, what, what's going to happen with Junior? So a, a lot of counties... Not all of them, but a lot of counties that we're doing a pretrial diversion or PTI, pretrial intervention. And so it's a contract that we have with the state. It's a good deal for these kids because you could get that whole arrest expunged off their record if they successfully complete it. Now they have to do a lot of upfront things. Right. And then I'll talk to them and I'll say, give me three, actually three to five character letters. I just did a case in Del Rio or close to there and they wanted five character letters. Wow. <laughs> you know, here in Bear County, they want three, but you know, just character, you know, people in the, in their community saying, Hey, Junior's a good kid. And you know, this is one thing or whatever it might be. And, and then I have my guys, I usually have them do a resume and then I might bring their transcript in, you know, and I submit all this to the district attorney's office. And they review it and they'll get back to me and say, hey, this is something this guy might, he does qualify for this or limit the same might not. Uh, then it's a whole different route. Now you're bringing up a good point in the sense that when a client comes to you, 
you don't just automatically analyze this case in terms of how we can beat it. I mean, there's a lot of that going on, sure. but a lot of people think that every time there's a jury trial, they're like, how can you make the argument that this person is not guilty? And frankly, most jury trials, from my experience, happen because there's not a question regarding whether somebody did something illegal or not. The question is, what's the appropriate punishment? Sure. What's the right way to handle this particular sure. situation? In other words, maybe somebody committed a, a crime of violence, but there's a lot of other factors that are mitigating factors, just like you referenced, that they cause due consideration to maybe reflect on maybe this person doesn't deserve the maximum punishment. Maybe society isn't best served by putting those people in prison forever, right? That, those types of things. Sure. One of my pet peeves is people who are addicts. Whenever I get addicts and you could just see it, they'll have pages of history and it, it's a crime wave, but it's against themselves. You know, they'll have possession, possession, prostitution, prostitution, you know, like four or five prostitutions. And once you know prostitutions, once you get so many, they enhance kind of like DWIs. And so they become felony level. And, you know, if you're dealing with a old school prosecutor and you go there and you're like, hey, this lady, she's been in trouble. It's like theft and so forth and you know she'll do two years she'll do the minimum in prison and then she gets in trouble again well then they'll do three and then well she's done two or three last time but it's not working this right. isn't working you know this person got caught yeah but it's not working what we're doing right i don't think we're not we're not helping our community we're not helping our taxpayers we need to fix this person you know as you know i'm in drug court I'm a big proponent of the drug work. That's that's my baby. That's something that I really, really like. And 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 people like that who have been just tossed back, just keep putting them in prison. Just keep on putting, give them the, give them you know another year or two, whatever they did last time, add another couple of years and send them to prison. It doesn't work. So for folks that don't know, what is drug court? It is a, a specialty court judge. It's like probation. So if you send somebody to probation, they have they go once a month, and they might have to do those state certified classes that we talked about. They might have so many community service hours. And these probation officers, God bless them, they they work so hard, and they have hundreds of people, and they, they might only see them for a couple of, a couple of minutes a month. But when you have high risk, high needs people. They're, they're not even going to show up to probation. And if they do that, they're not going to get the help they need. You know, drug court, like I said, it's one month to go see a probation officer. That's regular probation. The drug court, you see your probation officer three times a week, the first few months. And then you have counseling, group counseling, three times a week. You have your own counseling one time a week. You start building a sober network with everybody around you. So you're, you are busy, busy, busy. And, and by the time you graduate, there's four phases. It's like high school, you know, freshman, sophomore, junior. And, the, you know, they kind of move up when they're, they're doing well. Right. And the phases. Yeah, the four phases. And some of the greatest moments in my career is, is just going to their graduation. And just seeing the people, and you see like the before and after photos of these people, and, and some of their stories. I mean, that's it's a Christmas miracle. It is. Yeah, it is to watch that. Those are definitely feel good moments. They are for me too. Our channels. I'm enjoying this conversation. Let's take a quick Q and A break. We'll be right. Back. This is Q and A with Judge Ron Rangel. Submit your question today at beyondthegavelpodcast.com. Welcome to the Q&A break. We have a question. After elections, some of the district courts in Bear County moved to new courtrooms. Why? How did you all determine who goes into which courtroom? I thought they were all more or less the same, so I don't understand why some of the judges would want a new one. Let me tell you how it works in Bear County, and this is a tradition that's existed for a long time. Every two years, there's an election. In that election, we always get new judges that come into the courthouse. There was an agreement by Judge Mary Roman a few years ago when she was a local administrative judge, wherein the district courts on the criminal side would have the corner offices and the corner courtrooms, and the county courts at law would have the interior courtroom. Now, I used to be on a different floor when I first came in. I was on a floor as an interior courtroom, but then I was involved with the idea of changing the fourth floor of the Justice Center into new courtrooms. So the technology on the fourth floor courtrooms is much better, much more advanced in technology in other courtrooms. So every time we have a new election, we go by seniority. Who is the most senior criminal district court judge? It's been me for quite a while. As a result, I've chosen the office that I'm in now. Charles, do you have any input on that? 
Well, like, like you said, it's tradition and seniority. If you're in any other company and you get promoted, you know, you're going to move offices. That's just the nature of the business. That question clearly came from someone who lives within our county. Thank you so much for paying attention to what's happening in the courthouse. That was a nice question to answer. Please keep asking those questions. Let's head back into the show. This is Q&A with Judge Ron Rangel. Submit your question today at beyondthegavelpodcast.com. Welcome back. I'm here talking to Charles. So let's say somebody then comes in, you've determined, okay, there's a guilt innocence issue. The appropriate sentence for this person is five years probation, and the prosecutor thinks the appropriate sentence is 10 years in prison. So you think, maybe we got a jury trial on our hands. What happens with the case then? Sometimes there's two different ways I go about that. So for instance, let me use an example. I had a DWI in the county court, and I was reading through the discovery, the Blood, for whatever reason, was tested in El Paso, not in Austin. Mm-hmm. I don't under- I don't know why, but it was. It was sent over there. And I'm like, they're not going to bring this person from El Paso over here to testify about the blood. But a mis- in a misdemeanor <laughs> DWI. In a misdemeanor DWI. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, the state was not going to waive the point one five. And so I- I'm like scratching my head here. I was like, well, this is something that I'm going to set for trial. And the point one five is important for a reason. Right? Because it's enhancement. Right. And so instead of a, a DWI is a class B, punishable up to six months and up to $2,000 fine, versus a class A is double that, a year to 4000 And I've been asking, like, hey, let's just do a regular DWI or whatever it might be. No, no, no. Let's, let's go to trial. Let's see if you can bring that person up from El Paso. Mm-hmm. So that might be something that all of a sudden on the day of trial, well, hey, Charles, maybe you, maybe we'll waive that point one five today. Yeah, because a lab technician from El Paso is going to say, hey, I'm busy. I'm not going to fly to San Antonio to testify in a class B misdemeanor jury trial. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So that's one one reason I might do it. The other one is I had a murder trial mm-hmm. last, I want to say October, almost a year ago. Mm-hmm. And, and we tried self-defense of a third person. He, he was found guilty, but the daughter came up there and gave such an impassioned examination or testifying to the jury my guy got 10 years his daughter or the his daughter yes his daughter i think without that i think my guy would have been looking at like 20 25 years in prison what was it that the daughter testified to that was so persuasive she was good she was really good i mean how much she loved oh my god and like like how he would go he was the coach for her baseball team Mm -hmm. all through her you know young childhood And how good mentor. Oh my God, he's never been in trouble. So we're able to get that out in his daughter's voice, his daughter's emotion. And you know, she wasn't like crying for help, but you could tell it was coming from her heart. And there was two other co conspirators. And my guy is the one that pulled the trigger. And he got the least out of all three of them. So here's a question Would that impactful testimony make that kind of a difference if it was via Zoom? Oh, no, no, not at all. No. No. No, no, it's a far cry. That's why it's important to have these live hearings. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You, you have to be in there. You can just see it. You can feel it. You're drawn to it. And another court where I had a guy who was a DWI. It was a, and he was a, I think it was a repeater. Okay. And I got him in a drug court. I gave away the ending. And when you say repeater <laughs> means that he had been to prison before. Exactly. He's yeah. been to prison before. So yeah. those are tough to get probation for somebody who's already been, you know, like that's kind of what we talked about. That's a tall step. Right. And his sister came in and they're Iranian and they came, they fled, you know, years back. And she went up there and talked to the judge. The judge, I saw the judge. We were talking and the state was talking. The judge was already writing the sentence out. For her. I saw this, you know, you know, you can kind of tell as if you, you, know, you can see if he was writing this out, you know, the, the, the state was against us. They were opposed, right? They wanted prison and we were going kind of open to the judge. And I swear he wrote down the sentence already with prison. Uh-huh. And then I hadn't, I called my, the, the sister up and she went up there and just in an impassioned plea and the judge just, you can see his whole body. Yeah. His whole body just changed and just kind of relaxed, kind of sit back. He goes, wow. Yeah. Wow. Just looked at her. What he did gave him rather probation just from the witness. With, with the drug court program. 
Exactly, with the drug yeah. court program. You know, I, I always tell folks, they ask me about making up my decisions on things like plea bargains, such as the ones you're talking about. And I tell them, you never can make a decision until you've heard every last word from both sides. Right. Because you never know. There have been many times I'll read like a pre-sentence investigation, which prepared for us to think about what some of the potential issues are related to sentencing. And I could walk in there having a complete picture in my head. Good or bad? Sure. One or the other. Walk in, get the testimony from good attorneys, and and walk out of there with a completely different concept of who, who this human being is. Exactly. And that's what you're saying versus looking at it on Zoom versus being a person. This thing, looking, reading it on the yes. PSI versus having somebody come talk to him about him or, or listen to that person talk. Here's a couple of questions. I'm sure you hear this a lot. I used to hear this question a lot. How is it that you can defend people that are accused of Syrian violent crimes? It's a right. It's it's something that everybody has that right, Judge. And it's, you know, like I was saying, the guy that, that's a good segue, because like we were saying, the guy that I was driving on the tip, what am I going to argue in this guy's behalf? Right. He has an absolute a constitutional right for a trial. And so that's what makes our country great. Mm -hmm. And and even how many times have we heard stuff that we turned out to be wrong? And so you just never know, we need those protections for everybody in here. You know, one of the things that I've always talked about is that ranges of punishment in the state of Texas are so wide. For instance, on a first degree felony, somebody could be found guilty and get placed in prison anywhere from five years up to 99 years or life and anywhere in between. Sure. Most of those cases are eligible for probation, five years up to 10 years. Such a huge, wide range of punishment. Where exactly does this person fit in that spectrum? And that's always the argument. If you ask a multitude of people, what does justice mean? Well, you know, we can all define justice as being fair, even-handed, you know, uh, following the law. But if you take a particular situation where somebody was accused of a crime, you ask the victim, you ask the defendant's parents, you ask the defendant, you ask family members, what does justice mean in this case? Mm -hmm. You're going to get a different answer when you're, sure. looking, when you're looking at the cases anecdotally. Right? Sure. So, uh, so as an attorney, your job is to persuade, maybe this person is guilty of this, but you still need to put their best foot forward to get the best result for that human. Sure. And that's something that a lot of clients never quite understood. It's like, yes, they found you guilty, but the jury gave you five years. The prosecutor was trying to come up with an agreement to give you 20 years. Exactly. And so that's that's kind of like the murder I did. Yes. Right. And so we were able to get a lot less than the plea agreement. Right. So what you're doing then is when you're thinking about people's constitutional protections, people's constitutional rights, basically the argument there is, that's what makes the system just. It does. It really does. Mm -hmm. And and the best that you can. Because as you were saying, I mean, people might have an idea of what they feel right now about something, but six months, it changes. Right. Have you ever had a case that has had such an impact on you that you can look backwards and say, that case had something to do with developing me into the human or the person that I am today? Absolutely. I remember, like, as a prosecutor, I remember... And a lot of it is that something I always always say is always don't let your emotions govern your intellect. We're human, and that's going to happen to us. And I remember as a young prosecutor one time, I was a county court one for a year. Like that, I remember, I didn't have yeah. anybody there, and so it was Judge Alonzo. It was, uh -huh. you know, we tried a lot of cases. Uh, it was fun, and I, I personally believe that a lot of the jurors would come in and just want to convict. I mean, to me, it was so much easier being a prosecutor than it's a defense attorney. You know, back then you might have five thousand cases for a county court, something like that. And so there was a lot of cases that you had to be ready for. And so I was by myself. On most of them, you might have to be ready for 20 cases a day. And so there's just, as one person, it's impossible. So they'll say, okay, you're going to go on Joe Smith or whatever it might be. I'd go into the, the jury room and lunch. I, that's what I did. I'd watch videos during my lunch break. So we're getting ready in the morning. And this older term came up to me. And this also taught me a lot as well, that he kind of came in, he goes, why haven't you dismissed this case? He can like push me on my heels a little bit. You know, he, he was pretty aggressive about it. It's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. But I felt like I got defensive instead of listening to him. And so I looked at this and the person, after watching the video, I talked to the cop and I said, are you sure she's intoxicated? And he goes, yeah, I swear she is. I know she is. And like she passed two out of three standardized field sobriety tests. She, she flopped. It was for the officer. The most... What they claim is is the best one. I got a guilty on that. I mean, that was 
that was a pretty tough one. And even the judge just kind of judgment satisfied her. After. <laughs> you know, he just said, okay, you're convicted. Just kind of move on. Didn't put her on probation or make her do anything. Right. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> I was like that. And I, I thought about that. I should have dismissed that case. That mm-hmm. kind of changed me. I look back now and that's one thing that bothered me as a person. I could have been better instead of listening to what he, even though he was coming at me, not very nice. Right. I should have been the nice one. I should have been the stable. I went to his level. And so I grew a lot from there. Mm-hmm. I know I was human. I made a mistake. And I don't want to do that again. And and I still see that. Sometimes I see defense attorneys come up here, like kind of pushing the prosecutors a little bit. Right. And all they do is kind of the same thing. Like, what are you doing? Right. And, and it's, it's, you're not helping your client though. Yeah. You know, I used to tell my client, because every now and then clients wanted to see you adopt an attitude in court where you're being very disagreeable exactly. with the prosecutor. And I always tell them, that's just not how you get things done. No. You don't listen to each other that way. Yeah. You're going to feel good going to prison that way. Right. You know, that, right. that's what happens. Yeah. I mean, you know, do you want to win? Or do you want to feel good? And it depends why you're trying to feel good. Right, exactly. Are there ever any clients that you come across that actually scare you? Any of them make you afraid? No. So I've seen other people's clients that scare me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, you get a, kind of like the Hannibal Lecter. Mm-hmm. I've seen cases like that. And that was like, oh my God. You know, I look back, is that person getting a fair trial? Generally, generally, you, you, there's some people that want to start with you to try to, you know, whatever kind of, I, I don't know, machismo or whatever, where they kind of like push you a little bit. But uh-huh. I, I, I don't really care. I try to be nice to everybody. Yeah. That's one thing I really try to, I, I try to go out to my way. I try to be nice to all my clients, mm-hmm. all the court staff, all the prosecutors. And until you're in trial, I'm more business. So when, when you're dealing with clientele, you're dealing with attorneys and judges, and you're dealing with negotiating cases and working them out and trying to find the best solution for your clients, that's that's an art, right? You, you got to be sensitive. You got to be strategic in, in negotiating between the prosecutor and the client. Sure. What's that experience like for you? Well, one good thing about being a defense attorney, whereas you're not civil, so you get to hold all your cards close to your chest. Mm-hmm. So you you don't have, if I know something, I, I don't have to let the state know. But the state right. has to tell, they have to show me their hand. Right. You know, this is my poker fritz, I guess. Mm-hmm. So they have to show you everything. And if they don't, you can sanction them. You could say, hey, that evidence is it coming in or, or whatever might happen. So, I mean, the safe thing for the, the prosecutor is just, hey, here's everything. Mm-hmm. Besides my own personal notes, that's the best thing that they could do. Have you ever come across a situation where you've advised your client to consider an offered plea? Yeah, yeah. All, all the time. I mean, a lot of people have DWIs, right? That's mm-hmm. a very common. And uh, they have obstruction of a highway. Right. I always tell people that if you cannot have a DWI, you're a truck driver, bus driver, whatever it might be, right. teacher, nurse, you know, all these professions, you do not want to have a DWI on your record, then I think you should plead. You know, you could do this obstruction and we can get it done and, and you don't have to deal with it. You know, you have the bird in hand versus two on the bush. You know what you're going to get here. You can gamble. And and again, it's kind of the same long lines. I have told clients, let's not go to trial. And we've won. <laughs> <laughs> and I've told clients, let's go to trial. And we lose. You, you just don't know. It's I, always a risk. I cannot foresee what's going to happen right. as much as i'd like to you just you just don't know right what's going to happen you know you're dealing with six or 12 individuals that have different mindsets sure. jury trials truly take a life of their own they truly do it as you've seen i bet how many times have you like thought of one verdict yes and the jury come back with a different verdict. absolutely sometimes it happens on guilt innocence it happens more often on punishment you know you have situations which have been very interesting where we've had a jury trial and a jury came back 11-1 not guilty means that the defense is going to be emboldened they're going to say hey we got 11 out of 12 people thinking we're not guilty and then you have the next jury trial with the next jury which you have to do if it's hung and the state still wants to proceed and the parties want a jury trial and then they come back with a guilty verdict and give this person the max that's bizarre isn't it uh-huh. it's bizarre i've seen it happen more than once there's so many factors that we just don't even know i mean yeah. it's like hard to try to quantify or something like this where there's a jury trial where somebody was found guilty and given probation they appealed it it was reversed new trial 
had another jury trial, were found guilty and given a significant amount of prison time. And by the time the trial happened, they would have been done with probation. One of my favorite analogies is a bird in hand versus two in the bush. Uh Whenever I talk to my people, like, this you know Uh you're going to get. Yeah. I mean, I can kind of guess what you're going to get if we go to trial, but that's what I always do. I always kind of map out with my clients, like, here's your plea offer. Yeah. We can try and negotiate maybe with this, but if we go to trial, we might get a not guilty where you and I high five each other and you get an expunction for free within 30 days yeah. or they find you guilty and you know, there's probation or jail or prison. You never know. You never know. I used to have clients come in all the time and, and ask me questions like this. What kind of guarantees can oh. you make me? Right. And, and for those that are lawyers, we're used to those kind of questions. How do you respond? I cannot guarantee your promise and outcome. I, I I wish I could, but I, I don't, that'd be unethical. I probably tend to be a little bit negative up front uh-huh. because then you get better than that, then they're happy with you. Right. So, right. so that's, I kind of. Well, but you know, I was the same, right? Because yeah. we, were, we were prosecutors exactly. first. So we understand that other side. Sure. We understand the risks that they're taking. Yes. Which is important, right? In terms of their, advising your client. Yeah, it's their lives. I mean, I remember the professor in, in law school, like you're going to have your client's lives in your hands. And very, very true. Yeah. And so we and to help them, to make them have an informed decision, we have to tell them of those risks. Right. Okay. So let's say you have a client that tells you, I want a jury trial. Okay. You're in a court where you know the next time you're going to show up, you're going to be put to trial. Sure. How do you advise a client then? Most of the time, I don't love to testify. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you have to, if that's self-defense, you're, you should. There's about a 99% chance you should. But most of the time, I don't let them testify hmm. i mean if they want that's their right so it's not me letting them you advise exactly them. but you want a jury trial that's fine you know sometimes you know depending if it's really bad and i think they're guilty and they're just doing this for whatever reason i like to get on the record whenever like you're not there hmm. i might go up to the court report and say hey i want you to take this down and i'll say hey this is the this is the plea offer hmm. and you're aware of that right yep okay and then if we go to trial if they find you guilty, you don't know what's going to happen. So that's one thing that I would do. So as a lawyer, you have a duty to communicate all plea bargain offers, and you have a duty to advise your client as to what you think about those plea bargain offers. 100%. Yes. 100%. Yes, we got to do that. And then a lot of times if we got to prep. Sometimes I'll bring them in the jury room when there's nobody there and like, you know, this is what's going to happen and, and tell them what to expect. And, you know, don't be laughing. Mm-hmm. Don't be laughing or crying. I just prefer if you just pray. She's in there praying, just look down. Write something down. Exactly. Yeah, there was something in this last jury selection, which we had last week, where one of the one of the individuals on the jury told us after the trial that during jury selection, some issue came up and the defendant opened her eyes real wide to question that. And that immediately caused that juror to look at that oh. defendant in a negative way. Uh, so you got to be very careful. Yes. Right? Oh, you express yeah. yourself. You can't laugh too hard or anything like that. That's that's always tough. To, and if they are going to testify, I think it's important to put them on the stand, like in an empty courtroom. It, it's kind of pretend that you're going through because it, it's nervous. It is when you get up there. I'm nervous right now talking right here on this. And we've known each other for 15 years more right yeah more than that 20 years 20 years show. make them feel you're trying to make them feel comfortable <laughs> yes and yeah. so you know you kind of you know, practice you know your training and practice kind of let that take over and then so let's say you get in the trial you start doing voir dire you know you which for those that aren't, aren't aware that's jury selection you start talking to a jury panel uh, what, what happens then with your client so what I always do is dress nice, mm-hmm. always wear a suit or a button down. It's important. Yeah. Um, if they are a prisoner, a lot of times uh, I'll have to go to the Goodwill. Right. And I'll, I've done that several times. Uh, you know, growing up as a new attorney, you have a court appointment. This guy, he doesn't have any clothes. Yeah. So I have to go to Goodwill, get all the clothes, get, you know, I have to anticipate how many days it might be. So I might have to get three or four different shirts shoes or whatever and i try to mix match where they have a button down some slacks and some nice shoes you get reimbursed for that or is that yes yes you do sometimes if it's court appointed you yes. get asked for the for if the... it's court appointed you do that it's kind of a hassle that's the only problem with the jail sure. because they can't have all these clothes you know it's understandable you know you don't want to give somebody five outfits and all of a sudden they walk out of the you know, out of the jail looking like, you know, a civilian. Yeah, the sheriff is very specific oh, yes. with how you deliver that. And they don't want you to bring that to the courthouse either. Sometimes attorneys no. bring them here. 
Oh yeah, and, and you got it. That's why another reason is to be nice. Right. You be nice to everybody because if you're nice to the bailiffs, I go out of my way. I try to be nice to everybody. It's something like this on the day of trial. Otherwise, I have to go to the jail and wait an hour and a half to drop off clothing. Right. Because I have to pick up the old clothing and drop off the new one because they can only have one outfit there the whole time. And you can't really send like a staff person because no. they want the attorney to do it. Yes. And so we have that. And sometimes if they have family, you're lucky and you can get them to do it. But most of the time, like you said, it's me. But what I might do is I'll show up here in the morning an extra hour early. I said, hey, can we get him a little bit early here? I have a shirt and trousers. Can we just switch those out real quick? Mm -hmm. And they will let me do it. So being nice goes a long way. I'm always good with that. I can understand why they, those that work in law enforcement think it could be a security issue. Sure. So yeah, it's good to show up early when you do that. You want to make sure they're dressed right. I've seen defendants come into the courtroom with a jury panel coming in and they're wearing the same t-shirt, you know, black t-shirt that's crumpled up and stained with beer and, you know, some weird saying on the front you know, where the attorney was, for whatever reason, didn't get them the clothes. And so they don't look very professional. What kind of an impact do you think that have that has on jurors that come in? That they don't take this seriously. Mm -hmm. It's horrible, horrible impact. Yeah, they'll come in wearing uh, some sort of advertisement for Budweiser right. or something right. like that, like a DWI. Like, no, right. no. I mean, just go home. You're, we're not going to have this trial now. Yeah. You know, that's kind of like showing up drunk. You know, yeah. it's, it's not It's not good at all. But know that, that I've had people that show up in, you know, muscle shirts or shorts right. or, you know, just, you know, just half shirts. And you're like, oh, no. I had the client come in one time with the silk shirt that had the, the tiny little marijuana that's <laughs> imprinted all over it. <laughs> yeah. No, just as you know, the, then you have people that have face tattoos. Right. You know, there's nothing you can really do about that. No. I mean, I wish there's a way. You know, and, and, and I tell folks, I understand society's different. I understand that the young of today view tattoos differently than my parents' generation. Yes. But you're still going to get those folks on that jury. Yes. You don't go in there and you look like you just don't care, like you're about to go to a, a bar afterwards. Uh -huh. and, you know, that the juries aren't going to appreciate that. Right. You know, they, they kind of size you up pretty pretty quick. Also, haircuts. Right. You know, the, I guess they call it the Edgar haircut. That's the new thing. Mm -hmm. It kind of started in the jail, if I'm not mistaken, where it just kind of goes straight across right here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, look, like, I guess it's not layered straight. And I'm like, I'll tell my clients, next time I see you, I want all your facial hair gone. And I want you a, a new haircut. What you're doing right now is you're impressing other people in jail. Right. That's the wrong audience. Mm -hmm. Our audience are going to be jurors and the judge. That's who we're going to try and press now. Right. And that's important because jurors aren't supposed to know that somebody is incarcerated if they're in jail while the trial's going on. Oh, sure. We're not allowed to let the jurors know that, that they have handcuffs on or uh, the leg restraints or anything like that. You're exactly right. And um, we had an impact court where all the jurors, this was about four years ago, all the jurors were lined up in the hall. And so they don't have the elevators over there where they bring the, the prisoners so in here, as you know, the prisoners are, are, are held on the second floor and they brought up and through their own elevator systems to each courtroom. You know, in between the courtrooms, there's a little miniature jail. Mm -hmm. Over there, there's no little holding cell or anything like that. So there was 200 jurors lined up along the hallway. And then my guy in, in uh, cuffs and ankle cuffs comes swaddling through all of it. Uh -huh. And the judge goes, I said, hey, they just brought my guy through there. All right, send this panel back. Right. So we just wasted 200 people. Right. And, and, right there, yeah. And it's a constitutional issue, right? The yeah. presumption of innocence. Exactly. Somebody is obviously incarcerated at the time of the trial. You, the Constitution and courts have interpreted it as saying that they lose that presumption. Exactly. Charles, I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. Judge, just been glad to be here. It's, it was a lot of fun. It was a great experience. Yeah. Now, are there any last words that you would like to give our listeners? There's there's so much more. We just kind of skimmed the surface, but it was fun, and I think it was informative. It really was. I think we did a good job for the hour that we did it. Hey, we have a lot of different topics that we can discuss. Sure. Yeah, sure. and it's always nice to see you in the courtroom. Oh, it's fine. I love to be here. You've had a lot of trials in front of me. Yes, sir, I have. I've had a few of them. Well, I'm looking That's forward to many more. Uh, me too, Judge. Me too. It's All a right. pleasure. We've reached the end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. You've been listening to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Ranghill.
Join us in the next two weeks where we are educating the public and expanding mindsets. Head to our website, beyondthegavelpodcast.com or your favorite podcast platform to subscribe to the latest episodes and updates.